Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live. If everybody can see me and can hear me right now, give me a thumbs up on your end just so I know that everything is working well and you can hear and see me. Again, welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. I'm so excited to be here with everybody. As we were doing the countdown, I was looking over at the chat function and I was watching all the comments come in of where people are dialing in from. And it's just amazing. We have a global audience, people from all over the world, Australia, Europe, Africa, here in the US, of course, which is where me and Selena are. It's just amazing to see the Fully aware today's topic is all about how to negotiate like a boss. This is a topic that is very close to my heart as well as my guests because it has to do with communications and feeling confident and really just knowing what it is that you deserve. So with that, I want to just kind of get started, but start with a few housekeeping tips in terms of what you can expect, what we're going to be talking about, and really just keeping this conversational. It's a chat between you, me, and Selena. So this is going to be about 30, 40 minutes max. And of course, we're going to be talking about how to negotiate like a boss. But we also want to take questions from you. So as Selena and I are chatting, be sure to drop any questions that you have in the chat function, because this time is for you. We're just so happy to be here with you and for you spending the morning, the afternoon, the evening with us, wherever it is you are dialing in from. Um, a quick intro about who I am. So my name is Jessica Chen, for those who aren't familiar, and I'm the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a global business communications agency. So we work with people from around the world on communications. We work with Google, HP, Medtronic, the CDC, all these different agencies and companies on communications. And the reason why I started this company is because I'm truly so passionate about helping people feel more confident in their speaking, which is why today's topic is so relevant because it's so important. Negotiation and communications really go hand in hand. So without further ado, I want to introduce my guest. I'm going to pull up here on the screen. So my guest, you may think. You may have heard her name before. It's Selena Rizvani, and she is a women's leadership speaker. So she speaks about all things women, leadership, and really making sure that people like us get the opportunities we deserve. She is an author, and she's also a columnist. So she definitely knows what it means to really put yourself out there and really get your voice heard. So with that, I'm going to bring up my guest right now, Selena Hi, Selena. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. And hello, everybody around the world. Well, Selena, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, you, you know, I did a quick intro about you, but would love to hear about yourself, kind of a little bit more of the work that you do. And I know you definitely have a lot of experience talking about women's leadership. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's really my mission and passion uh, to get to help women carve out paths to leadership on their own terms. That's the thing, <laughs> you know, not settling for kind of second best or less than optimal. Um, that's really my, my mission and passion. And one of the ways I do that is by teaching things like self-advocacy and negotiation skills. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I am a recovering good girl myself. So for a long time, this didn't come naturally to me. Uh, but I, I like to think I'm proof this is something you can practice no matter what your starting point and, and feel more confident doing. So I think we both, I mean, I can definitely share for myself that one of the reasons why I started Soulcast Media, a communications company, was because I personally felt like this was something that I wasn't really good at either. And I really wanted to learn how to communicate well, because communications definitely, as people are often surprised to hear this, it wasn't my strong suit. So I think you and I both kind of share that in the sense of like, okay, well, how can I better advocate for myself? What do I need to learn, right? What do I need to dismantle, right, in my mind to really get myself 
feeling better about myself and feeling that, hey, I deserve this. So Selena, I want to ask you kind of like your story. You know, mm -hmm. what was it about your work experience or experiences that you might have had that you personally might have struggled with early on that kind of gave you this aha movement of like, I definitely want to help people with this. Definitely. You know, I think a lot of it was growing up in a home, and I wonder if others around the world can relate to this, where I was taught to defer to authority, for sure, and to speak when spoken to in many cases, and to take just enough, mm -hmm. you know, not more than that, um, to be nice and accommodate and share. And, and while there's plenty of good things, you know, about those traits, sometimes they fly in the face of advocating for yourself at work or, you know, taking that really unpopular position that the rest of the room in the meeting, you know, uh, doesn't feel is right. Or asking for more resources, equipment, budget, um, compensation, whatever it may be. And so I think for me, I had to do a lot of challenging some of those stereotypes to take just enough, uh, don't speak up uh, too loudly or too soon, mm -hmm. um, and, and push on those a little bit because they were in a direct opposition to leading, mm -hmm. you know, something I went on <laughs> to teach. Um, and as you said, to kind of take apart and dismantle and explore. And um, I think there are really positive ways all of us can do that and get better at it. I really resonate with what you're saying because, I mean, obviously I'm Asian, Asian American, and I think culturally I was taught a lot of the same things of like, you know, defer to authority, deference to your elders, you know, making sure that you stay humble, kind of put your head down and work. I mean, these are very... Um, yeah, common cultural teachings for us, and at least for me, I can speak for myself that I grew up learning in my pretty traditional Chinese household, right? But, you know, it doesn't take long to go out into the working world and realize that the people who do get those opportunities are a lot more vocal. You know, I remember early on in my career, before I started Soulcast Media, I used to be a former TV reporter. And we would always have these editorial meetings. We um, And essentially, it's the reporters, the producers. We all get into a room together. And we basically just talk about the stories of the day. And I remember, you know, seeing my other colleagues debate, challenge, you know, essentially talk back to my boss, right? And in my mind, I was like, is that okay, right? Because yeah. I always just thought, oh, if the boss says this that I say yes right and I always thought that was just kind of like the relationship but I just saw that you know they were having my colleagues my boss were having these like really lively conversations lively discussions but I realized that's that was what was encouraged they wanted to hear that they didn't necessarily want just like a, a yes sir a yes ma'am kind of thing right and that's actually one of the aha moments for me actually when I was like you know what I can't just be like, okay, get my assignment and just kind of do my work, right? I kind of needed to learn how to, you know, explain things better, you know, advocate for myself better. If I didn't necessarily think that that was the right, you know, approach, I needed to say it, right? So I completely agree with you, Selena. So for you, how did you, how did you start feeling more confident? Was it just one day... I, I feel confident or was it like a pro process? That's such a great question. And, and probably it won't surprise people that it wasn't so much an overnight, but I did have something happen that was out of necessity. Um, and that is, I was in college and my family had kind of fallen on hard financial times. We had really suddenly lost my dad and it changed everything. And uh, I remember my school um, offered me less financial aid the next year. And my mom sat me down and she said at our kitchen table, honey, I can't send you back. You know, there's just not enough financial aid to make this happen. And that was at like about 18 years old. Um, I realized if anything's going to change the situation, it better start with me because my mom had never been to a four-year college, you know, let alone haggled with a financial aid office. And so I, in that moment, in that youthful moment, I, I wrote that financial aid office, this long appeal letter. And I said, please keep me, please reconsider, 
you know, here are the ways I hope to contribute to the university. Here are the million jobs I'll do to make it worth it to you. I'll work in the cafeteria, in the giving admissions tours, in an office, whatever it takes. And you know what, Jessica, they changed that package and they increased those aid dollars, not just for year two, but for year three and for year four. So I could finish. And that that's part of what started it. This idea that like asking for what you need can change your life sometimes. And even though you can have these loved ones and supporters, you know, and mentors and sponsors who are like rallying for you on the sidelines, nobody is going to ask on your behalf. And I think that was such a kind of seminal moment for me that I have a voice and it's, it's the one that matters when it comes to getting my needs met or, um, you know, hoping to influence a change of some kind. One of the things that I always say when I work with clients is, you know, the reason why advocating for yourself, like what you just said earlier, is because you cannot rely on other people to advocate for you. People have so many other things on their plates. You know, they're juggling their own career advancement. They're juggling their own family, personal lives, right? If people advocate for you, I mean, that is simply amazing. But I always call that like bonus. That's yes. a bonus. You, know, you have great people in your network who are there to advocate for you. But I think to expect your colleagues, your boss to always notice the work that you're doing so you get the credit, I feel like that is almost unfair as well, which is why learning how to advocate for yourself is really important. So, you know, Selena, I have to ask you, a lot of people when they think of negotiation, which is what a, today's topic is about. By the way, for those who are joining, feel free to chime in with any questions that you have for me and Selena. We will spend some time also taking questions from you. But Selena, when it comes to negotiation, I know this is a word that gets a lot of people ooh, a little nervous. It's like, how do you even start negotiating? Can you ask for it? Are you going to turn people off? Are you going to completely sabotage the opportunity, right, if you negotiate? So what have you seen has worked well. And I know there's an art to negotiation as well. Yeah, well, I like to sometimes share with people what it's not, you know, and I think all of us can probably recognize this one style on one extreme, that's kind of passive and yielding to other people. And it kind of communicates your needs are more important than mine. And I think all the way on the other extreme is uh, the opposite approach, you know, a domineering kind of insistent approach. You know, we know when we're in a meeting with somebody like this and they're kind of communicating my needs are more important than yours. And one of the things I try to help people strive for is what I call the magic middle, you know, healthy entitlement which is clear and honest and direct. And it kind of signals my needs, your needs are just as important as mine. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's not a hierarchy here. Um, and, and that's one of the things I like to share with people so they get a sense of what I'm suggesting. You know, not to hit people over the head with your ideas and proposals, but to bring that healthy sense of entitlement in how you carry yourself. And, you know, I would argue that there's really a, a positive to being seen as this straight shooter, you know, somebody who is clear and open and direct in their communication, um, you know, versus someone who's more passive aggressive, let's say. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind is this idea that, um, you know, oftentimes, unless you negotiate your needs, you can't get your pain cured. You know, you can't get your problem fixed. Oops, I just saw Jessica fall out of the live, but hopefully she's going to jump back in and join us. Sorry, everybody. Well, I'm going to answer one of the questions um, I see here that's really an interesting one. And it says, any best practices on how to negotiate being perceived as pushy? Ugh, yes. And I feel your pain. I really appreciate that question. I think this is the number one apprehension I hear from the people I speak to, which is I'm afraid I'm going to push too far. 
I'm afraid I'm going to somehow be too entitled, pushy, shrill, um, somehow damage the relationship permanently. And, um, you know, I want to encourage that that's something you can control in your approach. You know, that's something that you can strategize about in the way you communicate. For example, saying in the spirit of um, helping support our team's well-being, I'm asking for more headcount. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> hey, Selena. Sorry, I had um, some technical difficulties on my end. So um, no problem. We were just answering this great question, um, any best practice how to negotiate without being perceived as pushy. And so I wonder if it's okay with you if I could share about 20 more seconds to answer that. Oh, please do. There is research, though, that shows women in particular are more likely um, to get this kind of pushback when they negotiate because it's showing a quote unquote agentic masculine, stereotypically masculine skill to ask for what you need. And women can get resistance and uh, dinged for that in some cases. And one of the things researchers found has helped women overcome that is to make their request communal. You know, to say, just like that example I gave, you know, in the spirit of helping our team function optimally and, and have work-life balance and well-being, I'm asking for more headcount. You know, I'm asking for an additional person. So that's one way you can use it. And the one other thing I'd say is to consider using humor. You know, using humor. Um, one woman did this. She said, you know, research shows that if I ask for a raise, you're going to like me less after that. And she said, guess what I'm about to do? <laughs> you know, so there are some ways to address this that can, you know, modulate some of that pushiness or fear of looking over the top. I feel like timing also plays a part in negotiating as well. Obviously, you want to make sure that the timing is right. You know, you're not trying to do it at a time where your team is, you know, knee deep in a project on a deadline and, you know, perhaps your boss cannot have this conversation right now. So, or, or maybe, I don't know, Selena, what do you think in terms of how do you think about timing and negotiating? So you're making sure you're positioning yourself for the best opportunity to get that yes. Yes. I'm all about helping people get that yes. <laughs> and I would say, when is your leverage high? Because these conversations do come down to, you know, what you have that the other person needs or wants or relies upon. And so when is your leverage high? When do you have the most bargaining chips? I'd argue it's often right after you slam dunk an important project, you know, or do something that's really tied to your mission and seen as mission critical. Uh, how about delighting a customer or a client? Um, something that, you know, your manager may be aware of or you're making them aware of. So I think it's when you're bringing that evidence of your value or your uniqueness, you know, your unique value proposition. And it's usually not at your performance review when salaries and bonuses and raises have been decided already. So I encourage people not to wait for that conversation, but to really grab that moment um, when your leverage is high. When you're in this, you know, riding high, right? Everybody has that experience of like, you're like, oh man, I killed that project. I did amazing. And you're like, you know, pretty happy for like that whole, you know, week or two. Like that's a good opportunity for you to think like, wait a second. I know my boss knows I did really well. I know I did really well. Maybe I can take this opportunity and share with my boss and for them to now consider maybe is a good time to consider that raise. And I will also say, even if they don't give you that raise, for example, since this is what we're talking about that right now, if they don't give you that promotion or that raise that you really, really want it, at least initially, you know, don't feel discouraged or don't, don't give up, right? You mm -hmm. kind of have to always remind yourself, you have to keep pushing for it. Because Selena and I, you and I talked about before, you can't expect them to be like, suddenly, let me just give you a raise, right? They That's right. And, and sometimes good things do come to those who don't just ask once, but mm -hmm. go back a second and a third time, you know, for my book, a pushback that's all about negotiation and women. I was so surprised that the majority of the women I interviewed at the C-level told me, 
you know, I am more tenacious than most. Some of them said, look, it's not that I am the world's foremost CFO, uh, you know, ever created necessarily. It's that I'm more tenacious. I'm not afraid to go back five more times and say, how about now? Mm -hmm. How about under these slightly different conditions? You know, how about with this team rather than as a solo act? And I think there's something to that. And so I really encourage people to do that. You know, you can even use no to your advantage sometimes. You know, Bob, I asked you to consider this proposal. You know, you've given me three no's. I'd really like you to consider it this time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can work in your favor, but it won't happen unless, you know, you go back to the table often. Right. And like, and I think we mentioned earlier, it's really just right and i think a lot of times people just they think like oh my gosh is this something that i did is it me you know i think you kind of have to separate yourself a little bit and just be like you know this is for my career i i know i just have to keep pushing for it and you know eventually you know i i really feel like good things come to those who again i'm always huge about advocating for yourself but i cannot stress that even more like i think it's one of the most important things and i think i stress this so much because i really personally had to learn this skill like i'm kind of going back to that you know mentality of like can i advocate for myself is it going to be turning people off but i do realize and this is from my own personal experience especially running my own company that the more i'm able to showcase my value what i can offer and communicating that often and frequently that's how other people see it too right yes and and i think one thing i'd love to just add to that that is that you know, no good self-advocate is an island. You really want to tap your network. And I know sometimes that can be harder to do in these pandemic times of feeling sometimes remote and distant. But it's so important to talk to your network. I had a, a rejection not long ago, about two months ago, and it was really disappointing. It was a project I was so excited about, um, you know, and it didn't happen. And it was my network who quickly, quickly normalized that fail, you know, and said, oh, you got to know, that's like totally normal. Like, yeah. don't fret over it, you know? And and had I not done that, I guarantee you, I would have been like under my covers with like Chardonnay and Pepperidge Farm cookies for like much longer than a week, you know? But I'd say there is this competitive advantage to talking to your network and- mm -hmm. Again, letting them normalize, you know, helping you prepare before you get to that negotiation to clarify your points and counterpoints, to role play it, to mm -hmm. often give you validation to ask for more. Um, we have a question that just came in that I think is actually pretty relevant and that I also want us to talk about. Um, you know, this is from Whitney. What if you keep asking for work? but your coworkers do not want to share the work because they want to be important in their role. You know, how do you negotiate responsibility? So I imagine, you know, you see a project that potentially can help your own career advancement, but yeah, your colleagues aren't necessarily share, wanting to share that because they don't want to take all the credit. So given that that's the general scenario, Selena, what are your thoughts on how can somebody negotiate that? So it's a little bit more equitable and fair. Yeah. I, I love that you're thinking about that, and I would encourage you to keep at it, even if it is challenging. Um, but one of my favorite models for coming up with a strategy, you know, to influence someone else is called GPS. And it's to ask yourself, how could I attach to my proposal, whatever I'm proposing, the other person's goals, passions, or struggles, how all further their goals or passions with what I'm pitching and proposing, or how I'll alleviate a struggle of theirs in some way. You know, so maybe your first time around, you may not get the entire plum project that you want, but how could you use the other person's GPS to kind of think about negotiating a piece of it? You know, John, I notice that, um, you know, this project has you working late nights and it's really pushing you, you know, to, to your limits. I wonder if I could take the numbers piece of this or take on the marketing part of it, you know, again, show them what's in it for them because it changes the conversation from me, 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 mm -hmm. can I have, I want mm -hmm. to we, mm -hmm. here's how we're both going to gain 
you know, or maybe you take a different approach than the one I did with the struggle and you say, look, I know this is a goal you really want to knock out of the park, you know, that you're on the hook for. I would love to be of service. Um, what's a part of it where I could add value knowing I have an XYZ background? Um, I completely agree. And actually, it reminds me of in the communications world, it's always about tailoring your communications to the audience and what they care about. Right. And it's always a good practice, I think, especially if you're asking for something. And like you just said, going from this me to we, uh, one of the trainings that I do is, is like, how do you actually say this? So, you know, instead of saying like, I was able to do X, Y, and Z, instead say, that we were able to do this together. And I always say it's not that it's diminishing your effort. It's not diminishing your role in the project, but it's also showcasing that you as a, you are a team player. You acknowledge other people mm -hmm. who are doing that. And as a result, people will look more favorably on you and your efforts versus if you're always constantly communicating, I did this, I closed the client, I launched this project, I did this, right? Because in the end, chances are you might have put in most of the work, but in the end, there's always some sort of team element, team fusion that made it happen. So I think if you communicated that, um, that'd be great. Actually, it reminds me when I was a reporter, one of the things I wanted to do, and this is when I was working at New York at the time, at that time, I was a general assignment reporter. And I remember I was just covering the basic, whatever was happening on the news that day. But I was always very fascinated with wanting to have my own business show. And that was because I was just fascinated with business. I love talking about business. And I remember I pitched the idea to my boss. And at the time, he was like, you know, we don't have additional resources. You need to kind of just focus on your work. And I remember thinking, hmm. I think I structured that pitch wrong. Instead of saying I wanted to start a business show, I then went back to him a few weeks later and talked about how starting a business show could benefit our station mm -hmm. so much. I said, you know, it's additional content. You know, I was willing to go and put in extra hours to make it happen, but it's basically extra content for them, you know, which is in the news industry is what they're really looking for. It's more content. It's not like they have to pay me anymore. But as a result of that, I was able to kind of structure it so that it's not about just, I want to do it. It's more like how it can benefit the whole television station. And, and luckily it actually ended up happening. So. Wow. Oh, I love that. That's a great success story. And I think great proof that mm -hmm. it was smart of you to go back and do that. And I think people can even set that tone early in the conversation. You know, if they're worried about it coming across, like I'm going to come across entitled or uh, like I want the world or expect mm -hmm. too much, you know, mm -hmm. setting the tone from minute one, you know, thanks for meeting today. I, I'm really confident we're going to come to an agreement that works well for both of us. You know, Absolutely. you can set that tone of we, of us, of cooperation, of let's early, you know, and I, I think that matters. I think that can put people right at ease. Yeah. And like I said earlier, you know, even though I was rejected the first time, he was saying, no, this is not a good time. In my mind, I wasn't thinking, oh, woe is me, bummer, right? I was thinking, no, wait, how can I restructure this pitch so that they can see the value of it? So I think that's also something that's really important to always remember. Um, by the way, I cannot believe we are over 30 minutes into this chat, Selena. <laughs> it's been so fun and the time this has flown. But, you know, kind of as we like sort of start wrapping up here, I want to make sure that we touch on anything that you think, Selena, we should add tips for negotiating that people can walk away with as we kind of wrap up here. Yeah, I definitely, you know, I want to encourage you to do a few things. I think one of them is realizing silence is your friend in these conversations, you know, creating some of that like negative space in a conversation where you're not necessarily speaking or nodding yes to some terms that you actually don't really like, you know, um, that you're not feeling pressure to reassure the other person that all is okay if it's not okay, or if you want to deliberate a little longer and think through the terms. Um, you know, so I think the, the use of some of that negative space um, is really important. You know, taking some silence right after you make your request 
you know, for all these reasons, I'm asking for a 15% raise. Taking a beat of silence, right? So that you don't talk yourself down right after that. You don't say, oh, but I know it was a hard year for the company. And taking that beat of silence right after they give you their answer. Because it might delight you, it you might hate it, <laughs> it might be something in the middle, but you deserve to be able to think and, and consider that and ponder it, you know, without kind of agreeing to something you'll regret later. So I think that's really important. And I teach one other technique that kind of is the BFF of silence. And I call it affectionately an RNF, arresting neutral face. <laughs> And, and I say it because for women in particular, you know, sometimes when we do get a dissatisfactory answer, you know, we just knocked it out of the park, had an amazing two years, and we found out we're getting the crummiest raise on planet Earth. You know, we grow up with a lot of conditioning and pressure, women in particular, to, to be reassuring, you know, to not make it awkward, to, um, you know, be helpful and kind. And so it can feel a little scary, I think, sometimes to bring more of that neutral poker face. I know I've felt that way. And yet there's power in it. You know, sometimes the bigger power move is to do less with your body language, to kind of let them wonder a little bit. And, and I don't, by the way, I'm not suggesting to be inauthentic. You know, I'm a smiley person and I like it that way. But um Again, there's something powerful when you're not liking the terms you're hearing to keeping that neutral face, letting them wonder mm -hmm. what's next. The power of the pause. It's something that I think a lot of people are so uncomfortable with. And like you said, people are just talking, talking, talking because they're like, oh, my gosh, I, I don't want to deal with the sons. But the power of the pause is you're also letting other people marinate on the idea that you just mm -hmm. suggested. Right. A Absolutely. lot of times when people people quickly reject things because they haven't had time to really process the information because they also aren't comfortable with that silence. Right. But I think there's a difference between like that dead air versus that strategic pause. And I think as a strategic communicator, it's thinking about, okay, if I'm wanting to ask for something, it's like, how can I say something strategically pause and let it just land in the other person's ears so they can really get that aha moment themselves, right? And I think that's how you can increase your chances of getting whatever it is that you want. So um, Selena, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, where can people find you if they want to, you know, connect with you, reach out to you, if they have any of their potential follow up questions for you, where can people find you? Yes, please do connect with me. I would love to hear from you, your questions, your, um, you know, victories, of course, and your challenges too. So please reach out. I'm at Selena Resvani on every social platform from TikTok to Facebook and Twitter um, to LinkedIn. So please don't be shy. Reach out and connect with me. And uh, I've also written a book called Pushback, uh, which is all about the topic we're speaking about today. And you can find it really at any bookstore. Um, but I hope you all will reach out. Be sure to check out that. And Selena, I want to thank you so much for your time. And I really just want to thank everybody who joined us in today. I was looking at how many people have been logging in. And so we have over 80, 90 people who are on this, which for me, I'm just so grateful that everybody was able to kind of take a little time out of their day, listen to this conversation between me and Selena talking about negotiation. I know, at least for me, Selena, it flew by. I can't believe it's been 40 <laughs> minutes of us just chatting about communications. So for those who are joining, don't worry, we are doing more of these Soulcast Media Lives. We have a whole calendar of events coming up of different guests as wonderful as Selena all about communications. So if you are interested in attending all our future Soulcast Media Lives, be sure to go to our website, soulcastmedia.com, because we will list all of them. And you can RSVP and you can get the recording. And the website here is on the screen right now. You can see it, soulcastmedia.com. Again, just want to thank everybody for joining in on today's conversation. Short and sweet, but that's the point. We want to make sure everybody can walk away with a few golden nuggets of today's topic. And again, just want to thank you, Selena, for joining me today and look forward to connecting with everybody, um, whether it's on my website or here on LinkedIn. And be sure to also follow Selena as well. So Selena, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.